and welcome to a practical guide to neurodiversity in the entertainment industry. I'm Carolyn Hepburn. I'm a BAFTA film committee member and a documentary producer, and I'm happy to introduce our panelists and moderator for today's event. Joining us, we have Vanessa Burghardt, who made her acting debut in Cooper Rafe's film Cha-Cha Real Smooth, David Miles, animator and VFX artist at Exceptional Minds, which is an academy and studio that prepares young adults on the autism spectrum for careers in animation, visual effects, 3D gaming, and other related fields in the entertainment industry. Jennifer Westfall, founder, CEO, and executive producer at Wavelength, who produced the documentary feature, Let Me Be Me, about her family's journey in connecting with her son, Kyle, who is on the autistic spectrum. And today's moderator, Elaine Hall, founder of The Miracle Project, co-founder of One in Four, and one of the first TV film access coordinators. Following the panel, we will be answering questions from the audience. Thank you all for being here. And now our moderator, Elaine Hall. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm so excited to be here. Really um, enthused that BAFTA makes inclusion such an important issue as part of what you want to present in the industry. So thank you so much. And I have to admit, I'm a bit of a fangirl. Um, Vanessa, I love Cha Cha Real Smooth. And Jennifer, just the your film about your son, Kyle, uh, is so thrilling to me. And I've always been a huge fan of what you do at Exceptional Minds. So excited to be with all of you. Uh, my name is Elaine Hall. I am Caucasian with brown hair. I have a backdrop behind me that has an orchid and a sound bowl, and I'm wearing a pink shirt. And now I am donning uh, kind of purplish glasses. And we'll all audio describe ourselves. If we could just go around and audio describe ourselves so you, for anyone with low vision or blind can see uh, who we are. Hi, I'm Vanessa. I'm a Caucasian girl with brown hair. I'm wearing a striped shirt with lots of colors and patterns on it. And the wall behind me has pictures of David Bowie and it's rainbow. Hi, I'm David Miles. I'm a Caucasian male, brown hair. I'm wearing a black shirt with brown stripes. And behind me is a uh, image of uh, Exceptional Minds' uh, 10-year anniversary logo featuring the um, uh, log line, A Decade of Impact. Hi, I'm Jennifer Westfall. I'm a Caucasian woman. I have brownish blonde hair. I have big black producer-like glasses <laughs> I'm wearing, and I'm sitting in my office in Philadelphia, and behind me I have a uh, a, pic, a framed picture of my three children in the various, um, in some of my favorite spaces of them as people, so. Wonderful, so excited to be with all of you. Vanessa, let's start with you. I, You were so awesome in Cha Cha Real Smooth. Thanks. And you're welcome. And I hear that it was your first film. So tell me a little bit, about your process? Had you acted in school plays and, and what got you into the film business in the first place? Um, well, even before, I didn't start doing plays until I was about 12, but I'd watched a lot of movies when I was a little kid because I didn't really have any friends or anyone to relate to. So movies kind of filled that because I, I always wanted friends. I wanted to be social, but I couldn't connect with my peers. So I watched a lot of films and then as I became older, I really wanted to find an outlet where I could feel like I belonged somewhere. And that kind of led me to acting. So I went to a special ed school when I was in seventh grade. And that was kind of the first time where I felt confident enough to speak at school. And so I was able to audition for the play. And I just started through there. And then I took acting classes outside of it. It really became like an obsession. Hmm. That's so awesome. And how how did you find out 
about Cha Cha Real Smooth? Um, my agent had sent me the audition. It was like I signed with them like right before COVID started. So I hadn't gotten many auditions that year. And that was one of the first ones I got from them. And I immediately was so interested in it. It's so great. I, as a consultant, I remember reading the script uh, for, um, uh, for Cha Cha Real Smooth to give notes. And I was really moved by Cooper Rafe's writing and that the authenticity and the, the character development and the way- well, he- he consulted with me for a lot of it. Like we had Zoom meetings and he always was asking me like, does this feel right to you? Or how do you feel about this line? And it was like the first time I felt like my input mattered. That's so fabulous that the expert, which was you, a, a, a woman on the spectrum, being able to come from your own experiences gave the script that authenticity that it needed. So no wonder when I read it, it was like, okay, this is this is good. This is really good. Um, fantastic, fantastic. And David, you are with Exceptional Minds, which is I think one of the premier organizations in the country. Exceptional Minds just got received the nonprofit of the year from Los Angeles Business Journal. Congratulations. And really focuses, I guess, for more than 10 years now on uh, training and hiring autistic and neurodivergent creatives for um, uh, in, in post-production, pre-production. So tell me about your path. I, you were, I know you're just coming off from a job at Universal, but tell me about your path and how Hi, you got uh, to be so successful. Uh, well, so it's a, kind of an interesting story. I uh, originally was going to um, a community college in Orange County, Orange Coast College for um, theater and film production. And uh, unfortunately, I was struggling academically. And that's when... Um, I saw this um, CBS on my local uh, CBS affiliate uh, news station, this story about exceptional minds. Mm -hmm. And I'd always been interested in animation. I've always been interested in visual effects, but it always seemed kind of like this pipe dream. It seemed like something you'd had to go to like this expensive four year that I, I would never be able to qualify for in the first place. But um, this seemed like a chance to do something that honestly spoke to me. So I went there. Um, I was part of the three-year program, uh, graduated, and I worked in the studio portion for a few years. And that has allowed me a number of really um, one-of-a-kind professional opportunities. I've had internships at Cartoon Network. I've um, was able to be part of the Academy Gold, uh, now named the Academy Gold Rising uh, Network of, um, basically it's an internship um, enhancement program run by the Motion Picture Academy, uh, as well as um, other opportunities. I worked for a little bit as a VFX and animator artist for the YouTuber Lily Singh. And uh, finally, the uh, um, universal job that you uh, mentioned previously, that was um, through a contact I made through the Academy Gold uh, program. And I was a visual effects production assistant for the upcoming movie Strays, the um, raunchy R-rated talking dog movie. So uh, look forward to that. It's hilarious. It's, uh, and I'm not just saying that because I worked on it. No, it's so great. And for, for, the participants who are, who are watching for our audience today, it's so essential to be casting authentically in front of camera as, as Vanessa has spoke so beautifully about, but, but also in, in production and to get that creative voice, David, that you bring and uh, Exceptional Minds definitely opens that up. I, I think, uh, I know in my work as an access coordinator, we're and 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 part of one in four coalition. We are promoting hiring of 
individuals, neurodiverse individuals in front of and behind the camera and uh, your work uh, in production. And I also hear that you're, you're working on a, uh, a comic book too. So I want to hear more of that. Uh, yeah, actually, it's a little independent project of mine. So uh, the comic is called Umbro, U-M-B-R-R-O-U-G-H, as in like a borough, like the five boroughs of New York. Um, and it is a story of two young kids in a art deco 1930s style city that just happens to be full of witches and fairies and magic and just their adventures there as a sinister plot unfolds that they end up getting involved with and trying to stop. Wow, that looks fabulous. So any producers, writers out there, um, check in with David on, on that that he's doing. Which brings us to Jennifer, I guess, again, a fangirl, because I just love Let Me Be Me, uh, the story of your son evolving, really metamorphosis coming out of his shell and being the creative artist that he is, the fashion designer. Um, tell me a, a little bit about, I mean, as a producer, you tell other people's stories. And what was it that, um, that got you to be able to share your own story on screen? Um, you know, it's interesting. It's a, it's, the, the project itself took seven years before we were able to even release the film that we all felt good with. I think that it came about is, you know, like Vanessa's talking about and David's talking about in terms of their journey, the, the there wasn't a lot of stories out there about how autistic children are moving into adulthood. And I felt like, you know, Kyle's story was, uh, you know, one of many stories and maybe it could help others as well. So we, we went about uh, filming his senior year at Drexel. And I thought, let's see how that starts. Uh, you know, he had to create, sew, and show an entire collection as part of his graduation. Uh, and, you know, just getting him to that moment in itself, and of itself was a journey. Um, but I think that there was a couple of things about telling this story that were very important to me, because obviously there are many, many other films uh, with including autistic stories, and and uh, but not necessarily including always at least in the scripted space, the autistic people themselves, but that's why I was so excited with Vanessa's um, role in Cha-Cha Real Smooth. Um, but in terms of the uh, documentary space, what I thought was important was to continue uh, what had been established with a couple of my favorite films is How to Dance in Ohio uh, and, uh, and uh, Life Animated, was to be able to tell Kyle's story with Kyle's voice because many times the stories are told from the perspective of the parents or perspective of the siblings or that kind of thing. But really, I felt like this was an opportunity to really hear Kyle's uh, journey from his own, from himself. Um, the other thing that I was very sensitive to in terms of other films that are out there is I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure that the audience had an opportunity to, to go along with Kyle uh, to laugh with Kyle, to, to be experiencing him with Kyle, and not uh, make sure that we were sensitive to, to places where the audience might laugh at Kyle. And that mm -hmm. is the thing that I have found really disturbing in some of the attempts out there in other films uh, uh, is that the audience, and I've experienced this, where the audience laughs at the person, at what's been said, or what's on the screen. And I don't know that that was necessarily the intention. So those were the two that were very important. And I think we accomplished well in terms of how we put this film together. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that's really important with scripted material as well is that by showing it in real life from the point of view of the person on, on the spectrum, it does allow for people to see the truth and to not laugh at. I mean, there's, you know, television shows that where the character is either pitied, misunderstood, 
or laughed at. And by sharing the true voice, we get around that. Um, I too am a mom of a, a well, my son's a non-speaking autistic. And uh, I was a subject of a, of a documentary, Autism the Musical, and now the, the Autism the Sequel, which was more a parent story as well as the child's story. Um, what was it like for you? Because I know for me, it was really, uh, I have a whole theater and film program, so it was really fine for the filmmaker to ask me about my work and for me to share about my program and what I do and my creative process. However, when Trisha Regan, who directed Autism the Musical, when she said, oh, no, no, I want to go to your home and interview you, that was like, whoa, I didn't know I signed up for that, and I'm glad I did. What was it like for you as a mom to be um, on camera I mean, as a mom, as a producer, to actually have your own life story be shared. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, uh, it was, as you know, a very unique experience. You know, I've told many, many, uh, I've spoken in front of many, many audiences about the film. And one of the things that I think people need to understand is that the, the weekend that the director came, Katie Tabor, came to our home to interview myself, my husband, and our other two children, Jake and Annie, was the first time that we had ever talked about the experience of the program we ran for Kyle and how that was, how how uh, that journey was for all of us. It was always very Kyle centered, and so uh, so it, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people might say. Uh, you know, I guess I was really afraid of the judgments, you know, especially if we told the story, if we all told our truth, which is what I encouraged everyone to do, uh, is to tell your truth. You know, that's one of the things for Kyle that was very important. If we're going to do this, we have to tell the truth. Uh, we can't uh, embellish or change the story so that it might look better on screen or um, might appeal to an audience more if there is a you know one note we got was um, in the process of doing it is that there wasn't a lot of uh, emotion what happened to all the emotion and I was like confused like what do you mean and they said there's you know you crying and screaming and all this other stuff and I was like well there was all of that but <laughs> I don't know how that's interesting um, so and you, when you're telling a story about autism, you know, from all of our perspective, of course, there are lots of emotions, but um, but the real point of it was the truth. And maybe the truth is not always as emotionally dramatic as people would like. So that was a big thing for us. But it was a I tried to stay out of the film for a, of quite a few years. We tried to make it just about Kyle. But um, the, as you know, the directors have other ideas. Oh yeah, uh, Trisha Regan was, we didn't have enough drama in ours. And then of course my son ended up pushing someone at a birthday party and I fell apart emotionally. And um, we got, you know, one of the moms got angry at me. And so it, it made it into a film. So I can get, I get that. But again, coming from the authentic, you know, perspective. So um, of course, of course. And Vanessa, you're, you bring such authenticity and professionalism to every role that you do. I mean, your career is just taken off, which as it should be. Um, but what challenges did you have uh, when, make, when making the film? And, and how were they overcome? Or if it's not cha-cha with, with the other projects that you're involved with and that you've, that you've completed? Um, cha-cha, they're really weren't many challenges. Sometimes it's difficult for me to be with peers because when I was younger, I had a really rough time with kids my own age. And even though like, you know, they're a completely different set of kids, I kind of am always apprehensive around other kids. And I kind of always wanted to be with the adults, but that was completely accommodated. The last project I did, it was a neurotypical role so I didn't know how that was going to go down. And that was definitely a lot more difficult for me. And I know it's like, 
on one hand, it's acting, but on the other hand, there's kind of a line between not meeting your needs and, you know, doing your job. So I kind of had a difficult time walking that line in terms of like what, how I was spending my time, like not maybe taking breaks when I knew I needed them or saying yes to wardrobe items that aren't sensory friendly because I don't want people to think I'm less professional. So it's kind of an internal thing of sometimes making my needs smaller so that other people don't see me as like a burden. Wow, that's so important what you're saying and and why these type of webinars are so in, or essential. Um, my work as, as an access coordinator on set is just to help mediate that, really. I'm neurodivergent myself. I have um, sensory processing differences and um, visual spatial challenges. And uh, I mean, there's so many things that you... So when I'm hired on set, I come from that perspective uh, to be able to allow you you and other individuals on the spectrum, other autistic or neurodivergent individuals to have a sounding board so that sensory needs are met so that the actors can have someone they can come to. And what I find is the accommodations are so simple. Um, I mean, uh, I, I mean, you, you, you unpack so much that I, I'd love to, to talk about it a little bit. One of the things that we do being neurodivergent is we mask. We pretend that we're typical, right? And that can be to our detriment. I see Dave, David is nodding as well. And that can be to our detriment. So, um, like, at especially sometimes felt, well, tell I me was more. like, I was like acting before I even got in the scene. I would like go to set in the morning, get on the, get in the car and I was already acting. So then when it was time to do my job, I was exhausted. Exactly. You're exhausted because you're trying so hard to be someone that you're not just to be able to get into the car. And uh, I spoke with uh, Sue Ann Pien. I, I worked on the show called As We See It, which had three actors on the spectrum portraying three characters on the spectrum, a brilliant show. And uh, you know, she and I were talking about how we've been acting since we were, you know, since we were four or five years old in order to fit in to the neurotypical world and how, um, important it is to have an access coordinator on the set so that you don't have to start acting until the director calls action and you can be your authentic self. And that's why I want to encourage uh, filmmakers to, to be sensitive to that and to allow the individual the, to, to be themselves in all capacities. And uh, tell me your thoughts about that. I mean, on one hand, I wish I could, you know, go to set like any other person and not need those accommodations. But at the end of the day, I do, and it's not really on me. So like, I'm a person like anyone else. So I feel like my needs should be met like anyone else's, even if they're different. Yeah, I mean, I know actors that ask for a certain color M&Ms in their trailer, <laughs> and that's an accommodation. So asking for, uh, when I am brought into a TV series, sometimes I'll be brought into uh, TV series that are on their, you know, fifth or sixth or 10th season, and the character is autistic. We start right from the beginning with department heads to make sure that the wardrobe is not uh, too uh, itchy and fabrics that are not problematic and tags are taken out. And, you know, so that the actor can do their best work. And what's funny is what's right for someone on the spectrum is really right for everybody. I mean, what do you think about that? That everyone can get asked for their needs to be met. What do you think about that? 
Um, I've often heard before that um, just general disability accommodations are oftentimes helpful to more than the people who they're targeted for. Um, I'd also want to, um, I'm glad you brought up the uh, M&M rider thing, because it also, a lot of times, um, the sort of so-called ridiculous riders, they're basically tells for like the talent to see if the management at the venue has read the rider all the way through. So sometimes yeah. it can be a, an important safety thing, because sometimes like those riders will include important, important safety information for how the stage needs to be prepped and like seeing the bowl of like only green M&Ms or something like that. That's a quick way for the talent to know like, okay, they read the writer all the way through. They, they, they're really serious about like every single accommodation we've asked for. So I, I just think it's a little fascinating trick that people use. That's great. I never knew that. So I think that's really good to know. How about for you though, David, like any challenges that you've had and talk about a little bit of masking and what ways that you're able to get your needs met? Um, there have definitely been challenges. Uh, I think um, things that Vanessa brought up, uh, not being able to say no because you're intimidated because you're the new person on set, you're the new person on the team. So it's hard to, you don't want to be labeled as difficult. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there have been times, uh, especially in this recent job where I've uh, had to say like, hey, uh, the amount of work I'm doing is a little bit overwhelming. Can I delegate this to someone else on the team while I concentrate on this? And um, it's an incredibly intimidating thing to do. Um, but it's really surprising how much people are willing to accommodate if you just ask, if you, if it, if you just have a plan like, hey, uh, this, this, and this, it would be more efficient if instead of I do myself doing all of it, if uh, so and so and so and so could take care of this and this. So I, I, I guess like the best sort of advice is um, uh, know how to construct a plan uh, for how you, uh, when the time comes where you do need to, um, uh, what's the phrase? Um, when you speak up for yourself, uh, self- Advocate, uh, when you advocate, advocate, you advocate, advocate. yeah. And you would start with yeah. the name, thank <laughs> you. Uh, but for, for when the time comes to self-advocate. So David, it, it does, it takes tremendous courage for anybody to ask for help. And yet I'm sure by you having the courage to advocate for yourself, you're able to then provide the production with your best work. And um, by delegating, you gave other people an opportunity for them to rise up and to do work as well. So that, and I, I love what you said about having a plan. So a couple things hit me about that is I always ask my actors, I when I work on a show, I'll ask my actors, I have a, a Zoom meeting with them prior and then also PAs. Um, and as we see it, we had eight PAs, uh, neurodivergent PAs, but I'll ask them to write up what their food preferences are, what their sensory needs are, what their visual lighting needs are, sound. Uh, I've often asked on set to not use that horrible bell if you can not have a bell because that can send some of our actors into uh, kind of a an intensity and, and withdrawal. Um, and what, what I found, and I'm curious, you know, Jennifer, David, Vanessa, please chime in. When you do ask, I mean, David, you had such a great uh, experience. When, when you do ask for this, how was it received? And, um, and do you have that list of what you need as, um, to help your work go smoother? Um. So yeah. I don't exactly have a, a list per se um, of uh, things that I would require. 
I'm still sort of discovering the thing, the, all those things myself. Um, as far as um, how they've been received, I'm, I, I suppose I'm lucky that I have been um, in the presence of people who are more receptive. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's interesting because um, at a Universal, I didn't lead in with the fact that um, I came from exceptional minds, but I whenever I brought it up in just casual conversation, a lot of people would go like, exceptional minds, they do amazing work. Like, I'm, I'm glad that's where you came from. So it seems like the message is being spread about like... Um, people are more aware of people with um the sort of differences that might be and may i don't know maybe i've i i've just been lucky and i i hope that that's not the case and that it's just a greater public awareness that's spreading um i, I think absolutely the awareness and the um appreciation and and jennifer you know films like let me be me uh, I think are helping to spread that awareness. As a producer, what accommodations did you have in terms of filming Kyle, in terms of educating the director? What kind of accommodations or, I don't even like calling them accommodations, it's just needs that you I, may have experienced. Well, you know, as his mom and helping him through his accommodations as he got into college, because obviously it, his experience was a lot like David's in terms of having certain specific um, passions and 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 uh, wanting to pursue those passions, but without the academic success that is seems to go along with, you know, your ability to get in anywhere to be able to pursue those passions, right? So we a lot of work with Drexel University in terms of helping Kyle. Uh, uh, get get in and also get into get into his program. Um, so I was used to the system and how you have to play the system to get the right accommodations for for as as you said so well, just to, to have a nominal uh, a platform for some success, right? Um, because the 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 uh, this the atmosphere is just not built for uh, kids on the spectrum. Um, so we had already started in that direction. So I think the thing in terms of the producing piece and the putting the story together, um, you know, again, I'll go back to what I said before was keeping in mind what Kyle's voice was, keeping in mind how do we, that, that's where the animation actually in uh, terms of the film itself was so important to us. It, it's all based, it's fabric based animation because there were moments of um, that we just didn't have on archival footage. It's a very archival based story. Um, you know, and I said to people, you know, when your child is walking the runway and you you hear, you know, you hear it and see it, you don't think, oh, let me pull out my video camera and let's take pictures of that. And I just think if we'd had actual footage, it wouldn't have been right. The, uh, that's why I felt the animation really helped you, you as the neurotypical person, or however you want to call them, um, connect with how important and how much of a big piece of Kyle that was. It wasn't him just acting out to be difficult. It was him um, walking the runway. He wanted that experience, right? So that's that goes back to the, the producing part is taking, is that being respectful and taking it seriously where what Love that are it's about. It's the respect. Right? Yeah, it's, it's the respect. respect. And so then you take it seriously and you, as a filmmaker, you, you, you bring that respect to the screen. And that, that again was why the animation was so important. While the, while the storytelling was so important, because to me, it just, how do you help people connect with this experience? If you aren't honest, transparent and respectful. Um, right. So I, think that's so a no, big I, I love that. I think, you know, on, on set, um, it's so important to have that respect for everybody and uh, to to honor the differences that people have. And also what you know what you said, behavior is communication. So I, and I did find often where actors on the spectrum may not say 
if they need a break, if they have to um, use the bathroom, if there are certain foods that they need to eat, and how important it is for production companies to be sensitive and to ask those questions. Um, Vanessa, how do you feel the industry's doing and with, with representation, but also with inclusivity and, and allowing for different needs to be met? It's difficult because I know that there's an effort being made, but at the same time, it's like a, a handful of projects are coming out every year with autistic people and people with disabilities. And that's like so celebrated, but then hundreds of projects come out a year with people who are neurotypical and non-disabled and that's just normal. So why are like the few projects that come out with disabled people so celebrated? Like, why isn't it typical? Why aren't we a part of society like everyone else? And that's frustrating because I'm supposed to be grateful for those like three movies that are made a year when I just want to be a part of the industry like everyone else. I think what you're saying is is so important for our BAFTA audience to, to hear is movies that are made with individuals with disability. I, I worked on a show called Wildflower, um, which has two neurodivergent actors portraying neurodivergent characters. Uh, movies like Coda, movies like Cha Cha, they are celebrated. And if we want to look at things I mean, one in four coalition, we say one in four people have disabilities. So it's good business. It's celebrated. It's good business. For us, seeing people who look like us on the screen, the media, is so important. And there's a, a market for it. There's, there are, there's dollars that are going to be spent. So why not? Why not make more movies? I and mean, one of the things that we're pushing for is to have movies that uh, in television shows where just like what you said, Vanessa, where you're playing a neurotypical person. Um, what changes in the industry would you like to see regarding opportunities for neurodiverse individuals? I think just more, more of an openness, like, sometimes the way that I say things or that I do things or the way that I express certain emotions is different and people don't always see that as valid like the way that I express sadness or any sort of thing it's not the same but it's still that emotion but if I express sadness in a way that's not expected in a self-tape I'm not going to get the role so I just think it's kind of a closed-minded perception of like how people act and what how emotions can be expressed that needs to be opened up. That's so brilliant because then you're adding a whole new element of what is self-expression. You're adding a whole new 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 uh, design to the mix and changing perceptions. That's so beautiful. We're gonna, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, and uh, just a second, but David, I, I want to ask you the same question. How do you think the industry doing is doing what's seen on screen, but also behind? Because one of the things it, that we're doing with, with one in four is actually promoting hiring individuals that are neurodiverse or, and or disabled. And for you, what is it? Um, that last point that you just mentioned, that you're making an effort to hire people I feel like that is really, really important because I feel like the more uh, people in the industry get a chance to interact and work with uh, people with all sorts of different um, uh, just ways of being, I feel like is the most important way to foster more so than like a, a seminar, not to like discount this, more so than just putting people out there and letting them be known and letting them be seen I think is what really drives home the point David I think that's a really good I just want to build a minute there to Elaine because we do have Please. um we do have a an employee um who we've hired um he labels himself you know uh like Kyle um 
and uh, he's our uh, supervising editor. Um, and he, Joe, is fantastic. And it's it's what you're talking about. It's not only hiring, but it's also um, exposing them to other filmmakers. Uh, other, you know, and we've had various reactions. Um, you know, and uh, and but it's important that. Um, the skill set, because the skill set we are so grateful for is his um, uh, attention to every single detail of the of the edit of the how the how the uh, how the, even our setup in terms of how we edit in our in our production company is so valued. Um, and but it, there is a there is an exposure process that you have to stand behind them at the same time when others react uh, in a way that maybe they don't understand. So you have to continue to say, we, we greatly value these skills and we always will as, as, as wavelength. And so I just building off what you said, David, and, and I, I also just wanna say too, that I've known Exceptional Minds for a very long time. Udi Bennett is one of my favorite people, but there are, Elaine, so many moms out there who have done great, organized and built great companies to um, support our, our amazing kids. So um, I really applaud Udi Bennett and the whole team at Exceptional Minds as well. So yeah, so that's Big awesome. Big and that, that also comes back to training. And I know a lot of times I'll be working with production companies and I'll say there's no pipeline to, uh, to talent when it's just completely not true. I mean, that's one of the reasons we have a professional training program at, at the Miracle Project so that people can become writers and, and performers. But to, to have that training, you know, like the, what's happening at Exceptional Minds and Vanessa, you know, being in an acting program, it's, it's so cru criti critical. And then what everyone brought up is to be able to see the talent. The industry is missing a whole realm of talent, actors who may reveal emotions differently, um, production, creatives who have a different sense of um, presenting material and, and writing and creating and editors and post-production who have abilities and talents that when we can bring in the diversity, not only is the film industry elevated, but we're changing, we're changing the world because the media changes the world. So love to open to questions. We've got two questions right now. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who is diagnosed later in life and is now in a position where they need to ask for accommodations they didn't have previously? Great question. Vanessa, uh, David, you wanna tackle that one? So, um... I was diagnosed in my late teens, so I'm, I wouldn't exactly call that later in life. Um, but uh, my um, fiance, actually, she was only just recently diagnosed with ADHD. And so she's been doing a lot to learn about like how that has impacted her and her career. And um so watching her go through that process has always has been very interesting. Um, in terms of um, just advice, um, I, I think the uh, one interesting takeaway that I've had from this is when you get that diagnosis, you're not, now I'm autistic, now I'm ADHD. It's you've always been autistic you've always been like neurodivergent that particular way you just now have the words to describe it and once you have the words to describe it you can google it do your research and uh find out w uh what other people on the internet have done to help themselves and help others in this situation mm, great answer vanessa I was diagnosed as a kid, so I don't really have that experience. It was more like people, when they heard I was autistic, would form their own opinions about who I was and the things I needed, even if 
they weren't what I needed. And that's not who I was. But because I was so young, I wasn't able to say otherwise. And I wondered why all of a sudden, like people like my extended family were treating me differently, or, or you know, thinking these things about me. So I kind of I'm glad I was diagnosed when I was a kid because it kind of gave me a better sense of who I was growing up. But I wish I kind of would have had that awareness because I wasn't able to tell people, no, this this isn't true. This is like a false perception. I wish I was able to say what I really needed. That's so important in that there are many myths about what autism is and is not. And to be able to ask the person, each person, there's that whole thing, you meet one person on the spectrum, you meet one person on the spectrum, what they need rather than have a preconceived notion. That's really important. Um, for someone older, I, I do, I work on a, a show called um, Love on the Spectrum. And I have a, a client who was diagnosed in his 60s. And similar to what David, what you were saying, that um, he was always on the spectrum, was always neurodivergent. And now it was almost like, doo, 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 his life started to make sense coming from that lens and uh, to be able to know he's not weird. There's nothing wrong that no, he's as Vanessa, you had said so beautifully, you're um, uh, you're unique in an individual and you have a, like everybody, but you have a different way of being in the world and Jennifer having that concept of respect for differences. So um it's great. Um, what advice would you give to other neurodiverse people who want to break into the industry? I feel like the um, most important thing, I, I feel like this, uh, this applies to everyone, neurotypical, neurodiverse, whichever, is um, make friends with the people you work with. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes, like, it's more um friends of uh the friends that you meet are how you secure jobs in the future uh also don't be afraid to be annoying in terms <laughs> of um like asking for jobs and asking for um for people to check out your resume etc or asking for recommendations and stuff like that because um, chances are you're not bothering them. And the worst case scenario is if you are, then you're not going to get that job anyway. So don't be afraid to just put yourself out there and be annoying. I love that. We can call it self-promoting instead of annoying. So that's awesome. Um, Jennifer, as a producer, what advice would you give to other neurodiverse people who want to break into the industry? Yeah, I, lo I love what you're saying, David. And I, I love what you were saying too, Vanessa, in terms of, um, you know, it really is requiring a lot of education, you know, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I just remember when Kyle was younger and, um, you know, you remember Elaine too, the attitude was to get these autistic children around normal children and therefore they would become normal, right? <laughs> And I was thought that was a fascinating concept, but not one that I subscribe to. Um, and I like what you're saying, David, play, go make friends with the people you play with. You know, there's this great line from this, this um, film called All About Steve, where Sandra Bullock won the Raspberry Award. Apparently no one liked the film except for me. I think I'm the only one who liked it. But there's this great line that Sandra Bullock has at the end of the film is go find people as normal as you. And I used to say to my kids all the time, you're just going to have to find people as normal as you. Um, because the, the concept of normal is just so drastically, you know, used to destroy people's lives. And, and I feel like we go back to that self-advocate and you know, I go back to the person who says, now that I'm autistic, what do I do for accommodations? I think the best thing to do is what you're both saying is, is figure out what those are, figure out what's important for you, and then go find people to help you advocate for yourself because it is hard and lonely to advocate for yourself in a world where everyone expects you to be normal. So um, it would be uh, in a way, okay, so you didn't have these accommodations before, 
but you're now realizing things you need, how to take that to your boss, take that to your coworkers and say, and maybe you all saw this, I didn't see this, but I need to have a break every, you know, 20 minutes instead of every two hours because just I need to reset or however it is for yourself. But the 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 advocacy and self-advocacy part, I agree with both of you, is go find people who are willing to join you in that effort um, so that you do feel supported and you're not all alone um, in that space. It's beautiful. And that whole idea of joining, I know um, Jennifer and I both uh, have the same philosophy and had our, our mentors, which is about joining the world and um, the uh, bringing the neurotypical world into our world is something that allows for the neurotypicals to understand what's going on. And um, I think, you know, films like cha-cha and and let me be me and the work of exceptional minds allows for that um okay so why would to say one of the there's a what do you think the biggest misconception about people who are neurodiverse um i i want to answer that there was a, a show that wanted to hire this was six years ago individuals on the spectrum uh, to portray characters on the spectrum. And, and this still happens where they were afraid because of the myths, like Vanessa, what you were saying, the myths. And they were afraid there'd be meltdowns and all this kind of stuff. But no, it's the opposite. Being on a set, being in production, that's, that's our happy place. And uh, Vanessa, what do you think about the misconception might be I mean, I've seen actors work for 12 hours and can't ready to do more. And what do you think about that, about the misconception about people who are neurodiverse? Yeah, I like I when I did Cha Cha, I was still under 18. So I my maximum was 10 hours and I like was not ready to leave after 10 hours. I, I loved it. It's not it wasn't a problem at all. Um, I think one thing that's really big is people think maybe this is more like autism in particular, but people think I'm antisocial and that I don't want to talk to them. And so they leave me alone. And because I have social deficits and I have difficulty initiating, then I won't go up to anyone and no one will come up to me. And then we'll have this complete interaction where people go around thinking that I'm antisocial when I'm not. I want so badly to connect to people and I want to talk to people and I want to listen pe to people, but I just need help but I'm not in any way like antisocial at all. Mm. That's so brilliant. There's such a misconception about that. Wanting to be alone. No, it's just being able to be around other like-minded people who will, you can be yourself with. Yeah. Yeah. How, how about you, David? What, what misconceptions do you have to have, do you know? Um, I, I feel like the, biggest misconception I've seen is that autistic people are difficult, that um, they have all these needs that you just don't understand, that have no real logic to them or something like that. No, there's usually like a logic to the <laughs> things that like people need. There's usually like some sort of underpinning that hey, maybe you need to like sort of think about or God forbid, talk to them to sort of understand like where they're coming from. But like, we don't do it to be diff. We don't have these needs to be difficult. We have these needs so that we can, um, so that we can make sure everything else isn't difficult for us. Yeah, yeah, that's so great. It is, oh my gosh, I could talk to you guys all day. Um, we're we're winding up, it's almost one o'clock. Now, um, just one last thing that you would like to share. Um, Jennifer, let's start with you. Something that you would like for people to know about hiring, about inclusivity. I think, well, I guess I'll just continue this. The, the space where we are, which is um, uh, 
there's this whole concept of, you know, um, people have to be a certain way for us to be able to um, interact, right? Uh, to, to find a common ground. And I, I feel like there's a, a, a lot of missed opportunities, especially in the film industry, um, because we don't reach out to uh, those not like us, right? To, to get the writing, the, the producing, the directing, the, the, uh, the talent, the, the, the skill sets to bring to, to the films. I think where people see uh, autism as a space that is emotionally devoid and full of difficulties, I say, I feel like we can find even richer stories in, in deeper emotional experiences if we reach out to those uh, on the spectrum, because I, I love people on the spectrum. They're hilarious. They're, um, they're full of great stories. They're honest. They're, you know, they're um, so talented, so gifted. And I, as I, you said a long time ago, Elaine, we're missing out on a whole genre of people and the ability of storytelling they could bring to the screen by not doing that. So my hope is that we continue to push forward and embrace. Beautiful, beautiful. David. Um, yeah, just building off of uh, what Jennifer said uh, that uh, inclusivity is something that broadens the entire scope of the human experience. And I feel like just as artists, that's something that we should strive for just as an inherent goal in general. Like that's something that we should make as a mission statement, regardless of like what other positive benefits there, there could be to anyone. And once again, like in, thinking about inclusivity doesn't just help autistic people. It helps other underrepresented people who are in front of or behind the camera. It helps everyone. Absolutely. And you'll find so many people have invisible disabilities that you wouldn't even know. Vanessa, how about for you? Um, I mean, I think we're all kind of saying the same thing in a different way because everyone kind of at the end of the day just wants to be included and wants to matter. Um, but I would say like, I have a lot to say and other autistic people and other disabled people have a lot to say. And just because our voices aren't always necessary, the, the loudest in the room, it doesn't mean to ignore us or not to listen to us because we matter like everyone else. Mm, it's beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Such pearls of wisdom. And um, I wish I could get to every question. Feel free to email me and I can um, answer other things offline. And uh, thank you all so much. What a, what a joy to be with you incredible, exceptional human beings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.